they do head by you with my co-panelists. Um, I'm very honored to be speaking here. Um, so I think picking up on what Belinda was talking about, what I'm going to address is that rather than co-opting women's narratives into these other areas, how can these same situations offer opportunities for women to act as agents of change? So positive opportunities that exist in post-conflict uh, situations. And so I think that first, just thinking about the topic of this panel, the idea of transformative justice is it's not only about addressing the consequences of the conflict, but it's also about addressing the structures that enable conflict to happen in the first place. And so you have to take a broader perspective on what needs to happen in post-conflict reconstruction to really move the society forward. Um, and in that way, one of the things that our organization works on in this is looking at how moments of post-conflict transition where institutions are being rebuilt or reformed can be strategic opportunities to embed gender equality as a foundation of governance and legal structures. Um, and I'm going to talk about this in kind of two different areas. The first is the foundations of the rule of law. So constitution, legislation, peace negotiations, and the other is in the area of justice. Um, so first on the foundations of the rule of law. One of the things that often happens in these transition situations is you're creating new institutions, you're writing new constitutions, you're putting in place new legislation. And that can be an opportunity for women to really change the you know, discriminatory classes that existed before, um, bad legal precedent. So there's a couple different ways that we look at this. One of the major things that can be done, particularly in constitutions, is defining what discrimination against women means. So a lot of constitutions, taking the US Constitution as an example, didn't embed any sort of discrimination against women. We only got a mention of sex as discrimination when we had the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And, you know, and some of the narrative around that was that sex was included to actually kill the amendment, not, to, not within a real need to protect women further. Um, and you know that can be compared with what you know in the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women has really created a comprehensive definition that looks not only at ending discrimination but also at embedding equality. So it's not only about not having women be discriminated against, but it also means that you need to put processes and laws in place that allow women to achieve de facto and de jure equality, and that is far more progressive. And so new constitutions can use that definition to really move um, and create a basis for women in society going forward. For example, um, in Kenya, in the 2010 constitution, it actually did create new protections for women um, and you know, including very specific language on what discrimination against women looks like. And that was used quite recently in a very interesting case where uh, Kenyan lawyers uh, brought together a case against the Kenyan police for a violation of the Constitution for failure to protect from sexual violence. And the Constitutional Court actually did find that the police, in their treatment of defiling cases, in particular with respect to girls, failed to protect Kenyan girls generally and were in violation of the Constitution. Um, and I think that's kind of an extraordinary precedent to look towards. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that this new Constitution that came out in 2010, it, it, it's not perfect by any means, but it did contain measures uh, that could protect women. And another way that constitutions can do this is also the incorporation of international law or human rights standards directly into the Constitution as enforceable. Um, I think you know, we've talked a lot about Security Council Resolution 1325. Those are built on the basis of incorporating other treaties, including CEDAW, including the ICCPR, as you know, the modern kind of expression of what human rights is supposed to look like. Um, and so, in another example, in Colombia, in 2006, lawyers in Colombia were able to use the Constitution in, that was drafted in 1990, um, which, which said that the Constitution had to be read in line with international law to actually liberalize their abortion law. 
the Constitutional Court looked at the looked at CEDA, looked at what the how CEDA protected women's reproductive rights, and said that Columbia's law that created a complete ban on abortion violated the Constitution in that it didn't implement CEDA's uh, the the mandates of CEDA, and so that actually resulted in creating limited but good exceptions for rape, life, and incest within Columbia. Um, and another really important component of all of this is women's participation. Both women's participation in creating these documents, legislation, constitutions, um, but also setting precedents within these documents for women's participation. Um, and so one of the things that can be done are the implementation of quotas. Um, for it. And you know, these are things that have been called for. The Security Council members have been talking about all day. We've talked a lot about uh, some of their other provisions. We've talked a lot about sexual violence, but a key component of these resolutions is also equal participation of women in ceasefire negotiations, peace negotiations, knowing that the presence of women, while not all women are going to bring what we would call a gender perspective, they are going to bring their experiences of conflict and their experiences of, uh, of their society as women. And so in these processes where there's opportunity to address crimes against women, for example, the participation of women is an incredibly important way to move that forward. Um, and the CEDAW committee has found that they found that if women's participation reaches 30 to 35%, that there's a real impact on political style and the content of decisions. Um, and one incredibly kind of, Rwanda is a very powerful example of many of the things that I just talked about. So after the genocide, the institution building in Rwanda has led to some extraordinarily, extraordinary movements for women. So in one way, the new constitution in Rwanda mandated 30% of women in political making, uh, political decision making. So at, the, at that point, they had 30%. In the 20 years since the conflict, they're, they're the number one in the world, and they're at 63.8% women in parliament. Um, the global average is 21.9, and the US is currently at 19.3. So it's pretty glaring to see. And what was amazing about that was it's not just a reliance on this quota. So they put in a 30% quota, and women ran in those first elections. But what the women did afterwards, and this really shows the power of women's movements, is the women who had those seats in that first election didn't run for those same seats again. They ran for the seats against men and opened up those seats that were available for new women to enter into parliament. Um, and I think that looking at that and looking at how incredible it is, and that's not only within parliament, now in Rwanda this participation has led to an extraordinary number of women as ministers, half of their Supreme Court it are women, um, and so setting the example for women's participation within all of these processes. Um, and then looking a little bit, so oh, that's on the one side, that's not how you can use constitution, new legislation within these, um, within these transform transformative spaces to move things forward. Then there's the justice side. I'm not going to talk about justice in the sense that we've talked about a lot today, which is direct justice for sexual violence. But I think one of the things is looking at the precedents that have come out on sexual violence is a good way for us to think about how that can move things forward in the domestic sphere. Um, and, you know, kind of as an aside, but what the case that obviously, which has been mentioned several times throughout the day, what was a case where sexual violence wasn't even in the initial charges, but it was because there was an amazing woman on the bench and a lot of women in civil society who rallied around and had the charges amended after the presentation of evidence to make sure that sexual violence was included. That's what resulted in having sexual violence in the this genocide. But so these precedents, you know, what they did was they made it clear that these crimes against women are the same gravity as other crimes. It's not, as Anne Green mentioned, boys being boys, or it's not the spoils of war. 
Um, and I think that that has an important impact domestically to understand that these women who are subject to these crimes, is, they're the victim of war crimes. And it's not about shame on them. Um, and that's important for thinking about normative change about victims of sexual violence. Um, and the other area is the standards and the precedents that are being set at the international level can be transformed to the domestic level. So one of the countries that our organization does a lot of work on is in Burma. Um, and in Burma, as of right now, there has been no accountability. Um, the constitution is in no way supportive of women, and it actually creates a provision of amnesty for military perpetrators. And, but sexual violence can remain part of the conflict. And so if anyone were to be prosecuted, they would be prosecuted under the rape law that exists in Burma from in 1866 from the British penal code. Um, and as you can imagine, that rape law is not particularly progressive. So, so it, you know, it, it basically requires vaginal penetration by a penis. So if you're a male victim, there's no there, there's no opportunity for justice for you within the domestic sphere. If it's something lower than not lower, but if it's something that doesn't amount to penetration, then there's no kind of opportunity for sexual assault or other types of charges to be brought. And so one of the things we've been working on with groups on the ground in Burma who are advocating in this new domestic, this new pseudo-democratic sphere that exists is for using international standards like the, the comprehensive definition of the ICC, which recognizes you know, it, it's gender neutral as a definition. It allows for objects, it allows for a whole range of crimes that's not just rape, but it also includes sexual violence, includes forced pregnancy, um, sexual slavery, to incorporate those within the domestic standards and create a package of new violence against women laws utilizing these international standards to really modernize um, what's happening there. And I think, you know, as lawyers, we're always looking for how to change the legal system, but it's not only within the legal system, because justice doesn't just mean accountability, it also means reparations, and those reparations need to be transform transformational. Um, you know, you don't want to just be responding to the needs of the woman. I mean, that's a very important component, but you also need to be looking at how you can prevent reoccurrence and transform the inequality that existed. And so legal reform is a key component of that. Um, and, you know, the other thing is you have to think more broadly. So one of the things we, that I've heard several panelists mention is that not thinking about, that we haven't been thinking about the socioeconomic impacts of some of these things on women. And that can often be very easily seen in reparation structures. So when you talk about providing reparations to a victim of sexual violence, you know, one component can be accountability, one component um, can be some sort of compensation. But, for example, using a woman who becomes pregnant and can't get an abortion, these also need to think about the longer socioeconomic impacts for that woman. Um, many of these women in these places get ostracized from their societies for being a rape victim. If they become pregnant, it's evidence. Um, and they can get kicked out, they have a hard time finding jobs, they also have to deal with the impact of raising a child born from rape. And so when you think about reparations, it needs to go beyond just that accountability conversation and think about the long-term impact. And those are all things that also have to be folded into the domestic sphere going forward because it's not just about a DVR program or reparations that's going to come from the ICC trust fund or from some international faith. These are things that happen to women constantly and it needs and it can have an impact going forward. So I'm going to wrap up there and then just